I think we're good to get going. So Max, why don't you start things off? Many thanks, Sam. <clears throat> so uh, a modular approach to payroll transformations. I see some familiar faces uh, live on the webinar who have gone through the pain or the challenges of completing the July payroll cycle. So kudos to you for getting everyone paid again. Before we move into what <clears throat> Uh, transformation might mean we're going to look at a common global payroll process and some of the challenges for each of the steps. So how we normally break down the, the payroll process in general, but especially also uh, here at PESAR is we have a pre-payroll phase that typically takes up to 60, maybe even more percent of the time uh, for you to prepare payroll or uh, for your clients for that matter. And then it, we move into run payroll, which I try to explain to my daughter, it's not actually running, but it means uh, processing payroll in, in the local payroll engines. And then once that's finally approved, uh, we go into post payroll, there's all kinds of activities that we need to do, like the GLs, the, the additional reporting, uh, getting people paid uh, through the banks, compliance filings, all of that stuff. And then we have some of the non-cyclicals uh, that aren't completely tied to the normal payroll cycle, but are still critically important. And <clears throat> when we engage with well, uh, clients or leads, or when I think back of my 17 years of global payroll experience, we came to four times three, so 12 different challenges that mostly apply to all of the global payroll environments out there. Whether you have 10 countries or you have 50 countries, it doesn't really matter. Most of the, the, the challenges uh, are uh, the same across the globe. So if we look at the pre-payroll on the far left, um, you would likely find, despite technological uh, evolvements, that there would be manual data entries, which inherently are error prone as there are no integrations, whether it's an integration with a file transfer, a classic file transfer, or there is an API. Uh, if you would do manual entry, especially in the rush of pre-payroll leading up to a payroll submission, there is just inherent uh, room for error. And when you do payroll across the globe, harmonizing those processes with an agreed standard is proven to be fairly difficult, especially if you use a suite of different vendors. You could use uh, XYZ vendor in, in some countries because they work best. You might use a, a regional payroll provider uh, for your APEC countries, and you might use some of the uh, uh, payroll engines to run payrolls uh, in-house if there are economies of scale. Now, just try to standardize those processes without any kind of middleware or, or platform on top of that. That's, that, that's fairly difficult. And, and what that means without that standardization, it becomes difficult to manage that process and to assure quality to your end customers. Now, email, um, who doesn't live from their inbox nowadays, right? We, we tend to still communicate a lot via email, also with our payroll providers, uh, despite having uh, a, a single contract or you know, having a, a direct uh, a contact person who manages the, the, uh, the relationship for you, you would still find yourself emailing. And once you're in an email thread, why not throw in a few employee IDs there or you know, some, some reports where the files were protected or not with sensitive information? That's the challenge. That's something that we shouldn't allow ourselves doing anymore in 2023 uh, with GDPR, with uh, ransomware out there. Uh, uh, with all of that, it's just too risky to email with any payroll sensitive stuff instead of trying to schedule a meeting, right? So those are three common challenges of pre-payroll. Uh, if you move into to run payroll or the, the payroll processing is what, what, what we see a lot and what I experienced in the past um, is that you would go for services, but you don't always have a free choice in which partners you would use. You could use a local accountancy firm or one of the global aggregators, but they would then say, hey, in Switzerland, you use this partner. In UK, you would use this partner. In the US, you would use this partner which from the outset looks awesome because you don't need to do any research. But what if you find yourself in a couple of years not being too satisfied with that vendor and you are locked in because you have that central contract and one platform of that same provider. And if you would then need to move from away from that vendor, you kind of break your, your model. Um, and th there seems to be more rigid service level agreements which have a direct effect on your payroll calendar. So it could be your, your processing window, which uh, leads to an early HR cutoff, 
which they dread, of course. Um, and you are locked into service levels because if you have onesies and twosies in a country, you might need a lot of more ancillary services such as employment contracts or uh, setting up a new hire, registering them. Whereas if you have higher headcounts, you might have a, a full suite of HR professionals in that country that could do that for you. So you want some flexibility in service levels. Now, once you get those reports from the local providers, hopefully not via a risky email, but a secure platform, you start piecing it together in Microsoft Excel, still the most commonly used uh, tool within global payroll or Google Sheets for that matter. We are, of course, agnostic to whatever tool you use, um, making sure the inputs tie to the outputs, uh, the, the same codes are used, that you are fairly comfortable um, um, approving payroll. Now, the thing with manual controls is, it becomes data at rest, so it sits somewhere. It's Although there are many sharing options, still it might be difficult to share those controls and especially harmonizing the controls if you cannot uh, dictate it through a central platform, you would have it in Excel. Also the audit trail of reviews, of collaboration, of questions being asked to vendors, if that sits in someone's inbox or a, a, a centrally managed inbox like I used to have in what was it, 2010 or something, BE payroll at company.com, uh, uh, NL payroll at company.com, IN payroll at company.com, you would want to have a better audit trail. Now, once we finally approve payroll, we go to post payroll, and then <clears throat> the finance counterparts are asking something of us, a very important something, because they want the GL files uploaded into payroll, and most likely in a very automated, standardized, adhering to a global chart of account way. But now you find yourself with 20 different local GL files or no GL files at all, just across the net mapping, uh, which makes it very uh, uh, labor intense and error prone. And in the end, we, you know, we need to think about our most important end user or customer, the employee. So when you issue out pay slips to employees, you would want to control that experience with a, you know, a, a very uh, user experience in terms of an employee portal, for instance, or you want them to um, have details into calculated payroll results for them to drill down into should they have an interest. And if we take those 20 countries, you would have different filings across that. Like in my home country, the Netherlands, which you might have heard from my exit now, we do have one filing, a payroll tax filing to the Dutch tax authorities. But in other countries, like the country where Sam is residing, Spain, you have different social security filings and income tax filings. At some point, someone will ask you, are we compliant or not? And you would want to give them an answer by saying, yeah, sure, he's the tracker of all the filings. So it might be difficult uh, for you to track those type of filings. Now, if we go to kind of non-cyclical ones, um, if you want to make a change in your environment, you have a new pay policy or the chart of accounts are rearranged or you want to harmonize some codes, you would want that to be self-service that you could actually make those changes yourself instead of sending in those change requests with lead times, with a, a, a proposal of a fee structure, with different types of people doing all the testing. You would want to do that yourself to respond better to business needs. Speaking of responding to business needs, the business could be actually the, the factories in a country or whatever retail business you're in or whatever business, they will have requests for you for around 60 to 70% of their operating expense being labor costs. What if they would ask you, can you tell me what type of overtime we have paid across uh, Slovakia, India and Poland for the past six months? Would you say, yeah, sure, I'll run it for you and I'll give it to you in two minutes and I'll, I'll share it with you over Slack. Or would you say, sorry, this would take me maybe two to three weeks of manual time, so I'll get back to you uh, actually at a point in time where you don't need a report anymore, right? We would want to be able to respond to those business needs. And then managing all the different vendors, whether you do it through a single contract that would just be you know, sending an email to one person who sends an email to the local partners, or you would do it yourself uh, directly to the partners, which is always proven to be fairly more uh, uh, practical. Um, you would want to control those vendors uh, within, a, within a platform. So hopefully nobody started crying now with all the challenges we have in Global Payroll. So let me at least say, despite of all these challenges, I give most of the kudos to you guys for keeping the world paid. So thanks for that. I think with that, Sam, um, we can maybe move to the, another slide. So with all these challenges, we do find ourselves in a predicament because although we would want to change, 
often payroll doesn't have a high appetite to change or has an appetite to change, but doesn't get the full support to, uh, to drive that change. So something either has happened or something will happen that makes you challenge the status quo. So makes you challenge your as is. Now we've, we've given a few examples here that I think also came from my experience. You could have an audit finding either from internal audit or external audit saying, hey, these processes you know, are, are just not up to speed anymore. And you get a remediation plan that you need to commit to within six to 12 months time. You need to make sure your controls are more up to speed. You need to make sure you are less reliant of a payroll vendor in terms of compliance. You should know your compliance position. All of those audit findings, although sometimes are, those are difficult to take in, right? Because you're working day and night to get payroll out, audit comes in, gives you all kinds of findings. Turn it around into something that could actually trigger a business case to help your own cause. Oh, payroll errors, of course, nobody on the call will ever have payroll errors, uh, but sometimes they do slip through. Sometimes there are errors, uh, either within or without your control. And those errors, sometimes you just need to let them happen to create a sense of urgency saying, hey, this is what happens if you don't work 60 to 70 hours a week. This is what happens if we don't switch out the vendors that we don't like and move them to the vendors that we do like which will result in unhappy stakeholders. The example I just gave around the overtime, right? What if it's, it's mission critical to get insights into those overtime hours and the GL uh, and the finance team just have two uh, aggregated data to actually give the key metrics to the business and maybe your financial uh, planning and analysis to do that. So your stakeholders will become unhappy and we want happy stakeholders. So that could be also uh, something that happens. Merger and acquisitions, right, uh, uh, of this day and age where businesses are consolidating uh, across the industry will make you have a disparate landscape because when you have a merger and acquisition, there will be a payroll provider there. There will be a global payroll manager there or a local payroll manager that you somehow need to merge. And the more M&A activity there is, the more disparate the landscape becomes, the better the use case is to start consolidation. And then hopefully you are all in a business that, that's growing, that's expanding, uh, but it might be expanding at a more rapid pace than you can keep up with. Right? That might be entering into new markets uh, every month and you only hear about it one month up front. Are you designing your operations agile enough where you could say, no, oh, that's fine. We'll set up a payroll within a month. We'll find a partner the legal set up an entity, we'll get the payroll running. So make sure you become an enabler for growth uh, instead of being a lagger. So those are kind of the events that we've seen and I've seen also personally that, that, that build a business case for transformation. And I think Sam, I'm handing over to you now for some business case starts, right? Yes, you are. Let me say, I just need to unmute myself. <laughs> yeah. So taking things from there, I mean, yeah, something needs to change, right? And this is the first point where we could start talking about um, agility, right? So if you run payroll for, payroll for a multinational organization, you know that while your overall goals are going to be pretty stable over time, right? How you get to those goals are going to, are going to change. It's going to change month to month. The, the overall goal is going to be you have to produce accurate, compliant payroll. And that's always going to be the same, right? But you're going to have all these little variables that come into play, you know, that Max was just talking about. They're going to affect what the process looks like for you to actually get there, right? So you're going to have mergers, acquisitions. You're going to have expansions into new countries. You're going to have audits. You're going to have layoffs, unfortunately. And payroll needs to be in a position to adapt to these changes very rapidly uh, because you're always on a timer. You're always working within that cycle, right? Um, hence, why being agile is extremely important, right? In this context, being agile, it's not just about being fast. It's about being very adaptable and, and being able to change to meet new circumstances quickly, right? So to be able to do this, your processes and your systems need to be set up in a way that makes it easier for you to change things quickly. Right. Um, and for a lot of business, it's not going to be like that. Right. Um, payroll is notoriously change averse with reason. Right. So 
it can it can happen that you'll find yourself in a situation where your processes, your structures, your systems, your vendors, your providers are set up in a way that's quite rigid, and it can be very hard to adapt to things that are coming to you very quickly. And I think the last three years with COVID and all the changes that that triggered have raised an awareness of that, you know, uh, in the payroll community. Right. So in many cases, if you're working with a traditional payroll provider getting new countries set up or changing your data model is going to be slow. It's going to be cumbersome uh, because you have to go through this back and forth process with your vendor to make it happen, right? So the main thing I wanna communicate here then is that when you're designing your internal payroll strategy, one of your top priorities should be creating a setup that is going to be very conducive to enabling future change, whatever that change is, right? And making that as smooth as possible. So let's build a business case, right? So taking all this into consideration, um, well, what is the first step in, in building a business case, right? So from my perspective, it's identifying the problem or the problems that you want to solve, right? And what you see here are some examples um, that are common issues that global payroll teams deal with, right? So service levels not matching your local business needs or allowing movement of levels, uh, lack of compatible middleware, uh, preventing HR from automating processes, 75% uh, of expense can be personnel costs, but you don't, you're not actually generating actionable insights from that. Um, the workforce is dissatisfied by repeated errors and no self-service, outsourcing models that can be very inflexible and don't allow for rapid portfolio change, you know, like entering or exiting new countries, for example, uh, and statutory and internal audits finding, you know, finding issues, basically. Um, these are not actually ranked in order of importance. We're just putting these out there as, you know, common examples that you can relate to that that lots of payroll teams will have experienced, right? Um, so to start out, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to audit your payroll process and your systems, and you want to highlight areas where you're experiencing friction, right? And by doing that, you'll come up with a list like this one, um, which you can then prioritize. And prioritization is very, very important here uh, because you want to be agile. You want to be able to make change quickly, right? And efficiently. Um, and to be agile, you can't focus at, on everything at once, right? The point is, and this is where we're getting into the concept of modular payroll transformation, is that you want to be very selective in choosing what problems you address and when you address them and how you address them, right? Um, so once you've done this exercise, the next thing you're going to want to think about is vendors and service levels. And I think I'm gonna hand this over to you, Max, now. Perfect, thanks, Sam. <clears throat> and I think um, before we move into this um, balance, you know, I think you all get a handout uh, from from Sam and the team uh, after you've you've joined the webinar, listen to it um, on demand. Um, make sure that when you list out those issues and the demands, you you also uh, link that to certain stakeholders that give you that demand. Because if you start translating the business case instead of what do I from payroll want, but hey, what what do the other stakeholders? want from us and therefore what do I need to deliver to them so what's in it for them and in a prior webinar just plugging that in uh, Sam, we listed all the different stakeholders and their perspectives that we did that deliberately first last month that webinar because it, once you have that stakeholder uh, map uh, mapped out and you link that to the demands in the current payroll uh, 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 system that you have and the, and the landscape, then you can say, hey, HR wants this for me, finance wants this for me, I could deliver it, but in order to do that, I need an investment in this specific area and this specific area. So you could keep raising your demands to me, but without approval and endorsement on this business case, I cannot start doing it. Now, I think that's an important uh, a thing to mention whenever you are building your business case. And if we're thinking of the balance that I used to call it in global payroll is always when you look at your services, you would want the best mix of service levels and vendor profiles across your entire landscape. 
that inherently means you are mixing and matching. Now, this is something relatively new to the global payroll market, although PESAR has been advocating it for six to seven years, but we need to get used to flexibility and options within global payroll. That means if you look at the service levels across the board, you would see in-house where you would go to market and uh, license a local best of breed software to run your payroll. Like Datev in, uh, in Germany, you would have Gray HR in India, you might have numbers in the Netherlands, you might have a different kind, uh, engine anywhere else, you would run payroll in-house. You would go with processing service where you would maybe license a, a multi-country payroll engine. You might go for managed service if you want the vendor to actually process the payroll for you and deliver you the results if you have delivered them with the inputs, kind of a baseline. You might want the BPO or business process outsourcing if you need that additional level of service, for instance, some uh, uh, help with employee queries or you don't have a large HR function in a certain country, you might want them to draft uh, employment contracts or uh, or read uh, letters from the tax authorities in a language that you have no idea what it is about. I, I've done payroll in Israel. Now my Hebrew isn't that great. So I did need a provider locally who could actually help me uh, to understand the demands without using Google Translate, right? Because I don't want to run my business on Google Translate. So I couldn't be stuck with managed service. I needed BPO. So that's kind of what you mix and match. And you could have the open platform uh, such as PESAR offers, right? That, that makes you agnostic to any service level. Now, if we would link it to different vendor profiles, you could have your local provider. Um, you could go to every country, find the best fitting provider. If you're in a, in a specific market, with specific uh, payroll demands, like with a retail business, or maybe you work in the oil and gas business with a lot of international mobility where your payroll becomes very complex. Not all local payroll service providers will have the ability and the, the quality to, 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 to build that out for you. Aggregators, you know, who have a more or less central platform, and they say, in all the countries, I will tell you which provider to work with, and you can't switch along the way. It could work for some. That's an option out there. You would have accountancy and expansion networks where you could have traditional big four or big 10 accountancy firms. You could have expansion networks that do uh, employer of record uh, uh, services for you. You could have a global provider that most likely still offers some of the distinct aggregator or local provider models. So it could be perceived as a global provider with one brand on top of it. But if you would look under the hood, it would still be a mix of a, a, a global slash multi-country platform and an aggregator. You could have a global payroll SaaS platform like the one that Paysar does. Now, I think if we try to mix and match those Sam, in the next slide and see what the pros and cons are, and this is really something also for you to take away. If you look at your own landscape of countries that you, you process or manage a payroll for, um, how would you map the providers that you have with the service levels that you need? So that's a nuance. The, the, the providers that you have with the service levels that you need, because you might have different needs in service levels. For a country with 10 employees or the onesies and twosies, as I mentioned, you will likely have a higher appetite for service levels like a BPO service. Whereas for the countries where you would have a high in-house payroll team, you might need to run it in-house or a processing service if you have a multi-country or shared service environment. So it probably goes too far for, for this webinar to detail every little nuance. But what we're trying to, to get to here is, is, is what's under the bar below is, do you know what the consequences are of either of these options for your transformation and business case. What if you would say, we need to switch vendors? All right, you need to switch vendors. Okay, why would you need to switch vendors? Is it because you don't have a global consistent platform and therefore you think, okay, I need to switch all my vendors to go to a, a global consistent platform. It could be the choice. What's then the, the, the result of that choice? And, and, and does it actually match with the service levels that you've just mapped to all the countries? Would you get the best service levels out there? Or would you only go with all kinds of local providers without any centralization? Would that really suffice all your uh, harmonization needs? Would you be able to respond to that overtime request that I just mentioned? 
this is something that we mix and match and I will encourage you to mix and match your own platform without going in too much detail now for this one, Sam. All right, <clears throat> so I think that kind of brings us into the models of change that I just mentioned, where we have a dimensional slide, which I also need to get uh, myself to, is like you would have a very, from left to right, so horizontal, large transformation program to very small and specific, and what Sam likes to say, surgical transformation. And on the vertical axis, you would see a very slow, which means it will be a multi-year uh, uh, transformation journey. And if I look at the attendees, who, some of them I know, it resonates if you're working on a global payroll strategy for three years and you don't see the benefits yet. So that's that's perceived to be slow. You could also do it very fast. So if, if you, by now, when you're building your business case, you've listed uh, the stakeholders, you've listed the demands of the stakeholders, you've listed why you can't um, uh, meet those demands yet. Then you looked at, okay, what are my options out there, right? You might do an RFI just to get a hang of it. You might give Sam and myself a call. We'll also give you some insights into what is out there on the market. You've mapped, okay, in all these countries, I need these service levels. And these are the vendor options out there. Now, what if you would map some of those scenarios? Because the business case never just gives one scenario because then there's no choice, right? So you always need to compare a few scenarios. Now, imagine you have 20 countries and you need to map out options because there are certain demands you need to meet. If you would go on the, the bottom left, you would take a traditional approach. So it's all or nothing, right? You go to the casino, you bet all your savings into red or black, 50% chance, right? There you go. But you need to rip and replace everything in order to do that, which means rip and replace, what does that mean? You need to switch out all the local providers in all the countries you operate in. So those 20 countries, you need to switch all the vendors. You need to tell the local businesses that, hey, we'll be using a different provider. They might ask you why. Well, because we have some global needs. Okay, so they might not see the business case. Going with a traditional approach means you need to switch out all the vendors. I think we have some more detailed slides on that, Sam, so I'm, I'm probably stealing my own thunder here. Um, if I would go to the modular SaaS-driven one, like what, of course, what we're offering, <clears throat> you could be very targeted, where you could be very fast, and it is a relatively small change, and it's not a big drain on resources, because you don't need to switch everything if you have a problem. What if you, like in the rainy Netherlands, I live in a house, there's a lot of rain, there is a little bit of leakage. It actually, there is a little bit of leakage in my house. I'm not gonna say, I'm gonna sell my whole house. I'm gonna move somewhere else because I have leakage. No, I call a plumber because I need to, 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 to fix the leakage in my roof. I'm not going to sell my whole house just because there's a leakage. That's the analogy I want to leave you with, with the models of change. Right, so if, I think we're moving into some of the details, right? So the traditional all or nothing, what does it mean? This is what we spend most of the time talking to with, with either existing customers or people who reach out to us to solve problems. So what needs to resonate is you always need to change from most of those providers. You need to change your local or regional vendors. Always. You have no real choice of service levels. Typically, it's if you ref, if you once you get the hand of refer back to that slide, it's typically managed service. So that's not in-house, that's not BPO, it's managed service. That might work for 10 out of your 20 countries, but it won't work for the other 10. So there's no choice of service levels. You are locked in with the vendor of choice. Sometimes that's awesome, right? Like a marriage, it's awesome. But over time, there might be issues and you can't just get out of it. Yeah, so you are always stuck with the vendor of choice. You can't choose your own local vendor as if you cannot choose your holiday destination. You would wanna have some level of control for your holiday destination, more so choosing the local payroll uh, engine. So we are locked in. And typically it's actually quite funny because it's also the reason why people want change is because they're locked in and they're not happy either with you know, with the reporting or the GL or with some of the providers, then go to market to find a solution that 
put them in the exact <clears throat> same situation in three years time because you will be locked in again. So make sure that doesn't happen to you. And your time to the perceived value is only achieved when the last country's moved. So that's where you see that bar, right? You need to plan out all those countries where you need to rip and replace your local payrolls. You can't do that overnight because you need to do parallel runs. You need to engage with all the local chains and engage agents. You need to check with your local business partners. Sometimes you need to align it with the tax year or in Belgium, you can only do it every quarter. So you need very detailed planning sessions to make sure that you plan that uh, uh, very carefully. And if you're looking for centralization, I think well, if you're looking for centralization, the realization should be you only achieve it when the last country has moved because only then you will have every country on that platform. Therefore, you probably have high implementation fees because you need to, you need to kill the contract with the existing provider with exit clauses. You need to pay implementation fees for the new provider and most likely it will be expensive anyway. So there's long return on investments. You need uh, to clear resources for this. Now, if you, if you would tell your payroll teams that they need to clear themselves for a couple of hours a week, but still do their day job, I don't think it will go down very well uh, with a switch test force. So with that, I'm not gonna uh, bash too much because while this might work for some, it will not for most. So is there an alternative? Of course, <clears throat> there is an alternative. So we've called it the modern software as a service business case. So think of what this means. If, if you remember the big bar of chains that went from left to right, which almost lasted like 16 to 18 months, this only goes from August to December. And because we had the time, we even repeated August, September, October, November, uh, and, and then December. So what, what does this mean? If you go back to the business case and the demands of your stakeholders, we have that demand of HR that said, I want to integrate with the payrolls and have more automation, therefore less manual tasks. People can spend more time on quality inputs. If we link it back to the overtime reporting request, what if you could just fix that without changing your local payroll vendors? You would solve customer demands, not train your local resources, and still solve the demands. That means you never need to change local vendors unless you want to. Coming back to Global Payroll and us getting used to, there's flexibility and options. So you don't need to, but you can if you want to, without losing the central platform. And there's a full choice of service levels. So once you're enthusiast, you choose BPO. A thousand and above, you choose in-house. In between, you think, economies of skill. Some you might do in-house, some you might do managed service. That's a common practice on a page. So you're not locked into any vendor, but you can also choose from partners if you want to. You know, we've partnered with, uh, but you can see on the new fresh website that Sam and the team made, I encourage you to look at the website, by the way, there's lots of information on there. You can see some of the use cases of our channel partners. So if you, if you don't want to spend time <clears throat> uh, uh, finding a lot of vendors, you could choose a, a partner of us uh, if you want to do so. So your time to solving problems is instant and there's no country rollouts because you don't need to uh, switch vendors. Very short ROIs, you would have quick wins and you can keep local leaders happy because you're keeping the vendors that fit. There is more change acceptance because there's a lot of change resistance within payroll. Also, when I had it in the past uh, doing a business case, it was very difficult to have leaders accept that we should not accept the change uh, of status uh, quo, status quo. So while the prior one might work for some, it will not work for most. With this model, it might not work for some, but it will work for most, if not all. So that's one I want to, I think, leave you with. Sam, I might be handing over to you now, am I? Yes, yes, you are. Okay. So, so what have we learned from this, right? Um, a payroll transformation project should meet certain requirements, right? Uh, Max said this earlier, and I like to use the term, but yeah, I, I like I like the idea that a payroll transformation project should should be surgical. 
right? Um, the best way to get buy-in for a project and to make sure that it actually succeeds is making the change um, you want and delivering value. Uh, sorry, making uh, succeeds making, and making the change you want delivering value is to limit its scope so it's easy, so it's very easily digestible, right? In other words, if you take uh, you know to take a modular approach. So instead of going big and saying, I'm going to fix all of these problems at once, you should break problems down into bite-sized pieces and address them individually one by one. Uh, and this reduces the cost, this reduces the risk, and it reduces the disruption of the project, and it shortens your time to value. So you're getting value faster, right? Um, by doing this, by delivering value continuously, what is going to happen is you're going to get your stakeholders on your side. And this is going to allow you to take an incremental approach. So you could say, I want to do this small thing first. I want to fix this reporting problem I have. And then by fixing this reporting problem, I have just proven to my, you know, my VP of finance or my CFO or my chief accounting officer, whoever it is, that actually I can help them solve a problem that they have. And then that gives you an opening that opens the door for you to be able to go back to this person later to your stakeholders and say, hey, I want to do something else now. And you have a proven track record then of success. And that means that they're going to have a much more positive predisposition to change. So you can continue to do these things over and over again by delivering value quickly in you know, short little bite-sized pieces, basically, right? Um, another thing that's important is that it should be low cost, right? So it's no secret that businesses are tightening their purse strings these days. Um, big expensive transformation projects are not going to get approved. We've seen a lot of this right now. Uh, businesses are very, very conservative in what they spend their money on, right? So by limiting the scope of the change you want to make and making it very surgical, making it very targeted, um, like we just explained, you can reduce the cost of the change initiative significantly, significantly, which means that it's going to be a lot easier for you to get buy-in. Right. Um, and the other aspect of this, of course, is ROI. Right. So it's easier to build a strong business case with, business case with positive ROI if you're spending less money. That's just a fact of, 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 of life. Um, the third thing that I think is worth emphasizing is that it should be low effort. Right. And this relates to disruption and to the degree of change you need to make uh, to improve payroll. Right. So ideally, you want to be in a situation where you can make change and improvement with zero disruption to your actual to your ongoing payroll processes. Right. The less disruption there is and the easier it is to implement change, the more likely it is that your change in if you, your change initiative will succeed in delivering what you want. Right. Um, and this ties back to what we've been talking about throughout the session which is taking a modular approach to payroll transformation. So by focusing on very specific problems one at a time, you will make life easier for yourself and your team. And ultimately what you want is you want the project to be easy to execute, right? And the final thing that I will say is that payroll transformation can happen right now. It's not something that you have to think about on a scale of months or years, right? Um, and this relates to timing and to immediacy, right? So usually in global payroll, yeah, projects and changes are planned and executed on a scale of, as I said, months to years, right? If you want to change vendors from the moment the team decides to make the change until the moment your new vendor is fully implemented and operational, uh, over a year can go by. Um, and often it can be more if the business is very large. Like if you have to rip and replace 30 plus countries, it could take more than a year. It could take two years or, you know, who knows how long, right? Um, but these kinds of like super extensive dilated timelines for change only exist because companies are doing traditional rip and replace, right? If instead of doing rip and replace, you're taking a modular approach, you're being surgical and you're being very selective and you're breaking down your problems into small bite-sized pieces that you can address quickly, the timeline becomes a lot shorter. It goes from months to years to weeks to months, right? So you can actually produce benefit for the business uh, on a scale of four, five, six, eight, 12 weeks. Um, and that's very advantageous, of course, because it's gonna improve your quality of life as a payroll team. It's gonna make your stakeholders happy. 
and it's going to give you that validation you want that you know you're proving value and you're proving that you can help your stakeholders with the things that they want right um and i think i'll leave it with that max would you like to add anything well thank you for Explain it all, Sam. There's no reason why we shouldn't be doing it now. I think, <clears throat> you know, I, I've also done this before. Sometimes change is very difficult uh, to manage because you see big roadblocks. I think what we're trying to do here is to remove those roadblocks for you because, um, you know, our our founders, Trevor and Mark, have built a modular payroll platform to help you guys. And I wish I would have implemented it before. I just had a, had a call with Sam. Um, and the marketing team who asked me like, hey, you know, um, what would you have used Bezar for in the past? And, and, and I would have said, well, I, I had generally good payroll providers. S some were mm, okay-ish. Uh, most of them were good, never really on the par. But I did have a big, big problem around GLs because I never could get good general ledger files. No good GLs. So I would have been very surgical saying, hey, I would have probably used Bazaar to just upload my cross the net files without engaging with any local vendors, which would have automated my GL generation uh, with my global chart of accounts. Probably would have saved my payroll accountants like 10, 10 hours a month of manual prepping around 20 countries um, of GL files. So that's why it could happen now and it could be very surgical without the blood. So to say, all right. Thanks, Sam. Um, I think we um, we have some slides around what does modular actually mean, right? Yeah, we can talk about the platform a little bit now. I think. Okay, great. So we, we we've been advocating, as you've mentioned, that you know uh, there is a modular approach to transformation in global payroll. There is flexibility and options out there. Right? I think we're big enough to say. We might not be the option for some, but we I think we're more or less the option for most if you want to solve an all or a specific problem. Now, if you look at operations control and you have all kinds of local vendors, for instance, or you might have some regional vendors, uh, but you, you don't really have an insight into where do we sit in the process. You you run your variance and your input to, to output validations manually in Excel. Right? Let's admit it, most of us, have done it or are still doing it, where you would do your validations, get your inputs versus your outputs, do all your cross checks. You have a variance control where you need to explain your variance as a threshold control. You will have start as levers. Um, you would need to you know, make sure all the bonuses are processed. You might even do a few, few checks. What if you could automate all of this with your existing vendor landscape? Or if you want to change your vendors, that's what this does, right? Uh, it moves away from Excel, it moves away from data at rest, and it makes you fully auditable. If your audit findings were around data security or harmonizing controls, this is what it could do for you. It would have compliance tracking as well, where it automatically would show you where all the local filings are at within every period. Right? I think that's, that's very strong in terms of operations control. And Sam, you'll chip in at any stage if you want to. If you if you don't, then, then you can progress the slides or move to something else. Perfect. All right, <clears throat> reporting. So reporting, everybody who has ever seen a demo of a payroll provider would have seen the inside dashboards and everything, right? If you would make it very practical, for me, this would be you get a request from HR, or you get a request from reward to say, hey, you know, what 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 actually have we been paying in XYZ countries because we're preparing for the annual merit increases? How would you respond to such a request if you don't have a consolidated view of all your payments? If we link it back to that overtime example, how would you respond to such a request um, if you don't have a harmonized view? That's what this does. And you could say, well, how could I how could I implement this without changing a payroll platform? You could just go into Pesar, upload your local GTNs. You will have included the mapping out there. You do it once a month. You could automate it if you want to. You could also do it manually and just upload it if you want to. Whatever is fit for purpose for you. Instantly, you will get access to all these reports. And not only these graphs, 
but also you could build your own queries. You don't need to send in change requests. It's as if you're working in Excel, but then in the Phaser platform, and you could have those scheduled. You, you could even just give self-service access to the people who always ask you for the same report. You could say, hey, I'll just give you self-service access to this, so you need, no need to bother me anymore with getting those reports. That's what this does. Yeah, I'll I'll jump in here. There's a couple sure. examples that are really relevant that are very connected to what Max was just saying, which is um, we have a we have a few customers that are kind of like paradigmatic of those examples. So we have one customer that is a very very large multinational company. They're present. They have like twenty thousand employees, sixty plus countries. Uh, they use it only for reporting. They use the platform only for reporting and to generate to produce their their general ledger files, their general ledger files, and that's it. And they have their own payroll providers. Um, they have, I think they have it regionalized. So they have one big provider per continent, basically. So I think it's one for North America, one for LATAM, one for EMEA, et cetera. Um, and since all of those providers are serving data to them in a different format, what they would have to do to do global reporting is they have to take all the data and piece it together by hand. And it's a huge amount of data. So it takes, it's very manual. It takes a lot of time. What they do is they map the data in the platform, they upload it. And then the platform, what it does is it just homogenizes everything. So they have everything in one standard format, which they can then query in real time. So they can build a report in two or three minutes, and then they can just run it over and over again by pressing a button every month. So if you know that your chief accounting officer is going to come to you every month and say, hey, I need to see these very specific things, you just press a button and the report is done in minutes. And then the other case that I think is interesting, which which Max which Max mentioned, was about giving self service access. Um, one of our other customers is Blue Prism. They're a robotic process automation firm. We actually have a case study with them on our website. Um, and initially, Paysar was only being used by the global payroll team. What is happening now for them is that they have something like twenty to twenty five different users in the organization from lots of different departments. And they all have, and they have self-service access to the platform. And you can actually um, limit access permissions, so you can maintain security and you can control who sees what data. But they have people in rewards and benefits and accounting and finance who have their own access who can go in there. So instead of coming to you in payroll and saying, "Hey, I need you to give me this data," you could just give them the access, and this you you know you teach them how to do it, and then it's up to them, and they can figure it out on their own, basically. Perfect example. And I think we can move on now. Yeah. Great. All right. <clears throat> HR Connect or um, the data grid. So, you know, what, what most of the inputs into pay will come <clears throat> in one shape or form from HR. So, that would be the area where you would be looking for to automate the most. And that's what HR Connect does. Uh, it's it's system agnostic, so whether you use Workday, Success Factors, local systems, HiBob, or you use exactly for commissions, you use Computer Share or E-Trade for your equity files. We've built it in such a way that it's agnostic to whatever service provider that you need and whatever HCM system that you need. You might have some manual uploads as well. <clears throat> That's what HR Connect does. And what it also does is, You've seen these automated data validation that I mentioned <clears throat> in the operations control module. That's actually driven by HR Connect. I had a demo earlier today with a client who were blown away. They, they said to me, if I had this for my 3,000 employee headcount payroll, it would make me very, very happy. And in my experience, sometimes it's difficult to make a payroll professional happy with tools. This would have made him very happy because what it did is, you would have automated your input process. Yes, you have to configure it, everything you need to configure. It would have automated those inputs. He had 10 different reports out of workday, uh, overtime payments, uh, data changes, people movement, starters, levers, all of that was captured in, in 10 reports. He didn't have a, a PC or a payroll effective change interface. He had a uh, 10 reports. We built out all of that, mapped it out. He just needs to run it or we can automate it for him. He decided to run it upload it and it's it's transformed into data that's digestible for any local payroll provider. So, you know, the famous flexi forms, we could build those in, in the system. So the local providers can also just automatically upload it. What it does is it says, hey, X element of HR Connect, for instance, 
commissions is a bonus in the local payroll system. What it would then do is, hey, for Sam, <coughs> our great Sam, who has earned uh, a thousand euro of commissions, we've instructed that, but the GTN comes back, it's, it shows 500. So it will automatically flag the 500 because we owe Sam a thousand. We don't need to review the whole payroll anymore. We can just review the differences. That's the power of, of, of HR Connect. Right. <clears throat> I think we're almost at the clock, right? We need to save some time. Uh, employee we, portal. We do, yeah. Employee portal. All right. Um, I think oh. we can. I think we can expedite this one. Uh, yeah. Just, I think. I think we can expedite this one. And we'll just say. Go ahead, Sam. This, this is, the name is very self-explanatory. This is a self-service portal where you can host pay slips and tax documents. And the important thing here, because a lot of a lot of providers have something like this, is that this is modular, which means that if this is the only thing you need, you can implement this. As, you can implement this as a standalone solution, uh, which I mean you, you can also implement it in combination with the rest of the platform. But it has the standalone functionality. And I think that's the most relevant thing that we could say about it. Yeah. Perfect. And then finally, what's going on? Present. It seems like my presentation is broken. I'm sorry. There should be one more slide here, which is called Accounting Connect, which for some reason is not working. It's okay. I can speak to it. So, so what accounting? Yeah. Go ahead. You speak to it. It seems like my presentation broke. I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. So, it's basically making sure that whatever local report in whatever language from whatever system you have will translate into a consistent GL file, which will be instantly available to you. That's what accounting connect does. So, this is actually about of all the modules out of the five modules, the module that you see a lot of deployed modularly. Because if you're stuck within a contract for the next three years, you can't replace it, but you, you, you just have a lot of headaches around uh, general ledger files. This is what you could surgically uh, uh, switch on with little effort to make sure your GL entries are automated. I think that's what Connect does. I'm going to leave some time for, I think, comments. I think Juan had a comment and maybe there are some questions. In. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. We do have a couple of comments in the chat. Juan said, I think payrollers get scared when some process is automated to the level of pressing a button. Yes, I do. I have encountered that. Uh, I have encountered that. At the same time, if, if you can save dozens or hundreds of hours a year on something with the guarantee that it's still going to be accurate and you're still going to have that level of visibility and control that you need, I think that I think that's that's definitely worth it. And, and Max, maybe you can comment because you have the experience of actually doing that. So Juan, I think there will never be one button to process payroll. I think there will always be a need for payroll professionals. What we're trying to do here <clears throat> is automate the process so we don't need to work 60 hours anymore. We're trying to make the work-life balance better because we still need to look at some of the anomalies, right? There's uh, a lot of AI talk out there, um, but you know that will still, at least in the foreseeable future, and that for me is up to the next you know years, um, we'll still need us with our deep subject matter knowledge to look at it. What we're trying to do is remove some of the manual repetitive tasks for you to actually sit down and look at those anomalies. Instead of finding the anomalies, try to explain and avoid the anomalies. There will never be a push of the button one. Maybe, maybe the kids of my kids, who are three and six, they might see the push of a button, but it will not relate to payroll. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we have, do we have, uh, okay. I think Debbie's out there, so hey, Debbie, uh, or I should probably say Deborah. Nice to see, you. reach out to me. You have my details or reach out on LinkedIn. We'll be happy to, to get in touch with you. And thanks so much for joining this session. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Just contact me yeah, on LinkedIn yeah. and we'll get something rolling for you. We have a few more minutes. We have three minutes for the hour. If we have any other questions, you can pop them in the chat or the Q&A tab. Um, if not, uh, then we will wrap things up now. So if you guys, if anyone wants to ask another question, go ahead, um, go ahead, go with that right now. If not, we will, we will start to wrap things up. Uh, Erwin, thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Thank you, Erwin.
Thank you, Laura. I hope I, I, I'm very I'm happy that you I'm happy that you that you enjoyed it also. Okay. Um, I don't see any questions coming in. So then I think what we'll do is we'll wrap things up now. Uh, just as a cl as closing words. Well, anyway, thank you very much for attending, uh, and thank you for the great feedback. A lot of people, you know, seem to have enjoyed the session, which makes me really happy. Um, as I said at the beginning, we recorded this. We were going to post. We will post the session on our YouTube channel, and once it's uploaded, we will send you a link. We'll send you a follow up email with a link to the video, and we will also share the deck with you without the little error that happened at the end. So you'll be able to see all the slides because something it some it bugged out for some reason. Um, and as Max mentioned, if you would like to learn more, if you're interested, you know, if you'd like to know how this could apply to the particulars of your case, uh, you'll have my email address. You can find us on social media on LinkedIn. You can send us a message or you can contact us through our website. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love to tell you more about it if, if, you're, if you're interested in that. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope I see you at one of our future webinars. We run these every month. So we'll be, ha we'll be having many, many more. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Sam. Bye-bye.